The views, information, or opinions expressed in this broadcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not represent those of any other persons or entities. Furthermore, some of the activities discussed might be dangerous or illegal. Attempt them at your own risk. Hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Peculiar World here on the Paranormal UK radio network. I'm your host, Jeff Davis. I still remember an incident which took place over a decade ago. This is around the time as groups began organizing themselves into paranormal research groups. Instead of ghost hunters, because this was the beginnings of scientific investigations, I was at the White Eagle Saloon, Portland, Oregon's most haunted public location. A group of paranormalists were planning an investigation in the upper floor. Now, one of them was upset because the hotel manager would not let him turn off the lights in the hallway. I asked him what I thought was a common sense question. Why do you want to turn off the lights to investigate? He looked at me like I was a bit thick and said, Because that's the way they do things on the TV show. Blankety blank blank. You have to insert your own title. Now, I thought for a few seconds and I cross-questioned him. I asked, Why do they turn off the lights? That one had him silent for a minute or two before he responded, and he said, honestly, I don't know. Now, to his credit, he did go back to the television show and sent them an email, and they did give him the reason why, and I don't remember what exactly they told him. But this does demonstrate how much television shows, particularly ones that bill themselves as non-fiction reality TV, influence people who want to investigate the paranormal. To a lesser extent, other television shows billed as fiction paranormal also influenced people, as do the big screen movies. Most paranormal-minded people I know watch every movie with ghosts, even if they're ultimately disappointed in what they think is the accuracy of the film. And they keep on going back for more. Which leads me to wonder how much movies influence our beliefs in the paranormal at an unconscious level. For some of us, this begins with the many gothic horror-style movies produced from the 50s through the 80s. Two of the major influences on me were movies from Hammer Studios and producer-director genius Roger Corman. I have grabbed some factoids from Wikipedia, and as we all know, if it's on Wikipedia, it must be true. Hammer Films Production is a British film production company based in London. Founded in 1934, the company is best known for a series of gothic horror films made in the mid-1950s until the 70s. Many of these involve classic horror characters such as Baron Frankenstein, Count Dracula, and The Mummy, which Hammer reintroduced to audiences by filming them in vivid color for the first time. What the Wikipedia article does not talk about, some other details about their success formula. When I was going through puberty, I tuned into the late night television movies, reruns and such, which included a lot of Hammer films. There were lots of women dressed in low cut tops in these movies. There was gore and an aura of the forbidden and slightly wanton sexuality. This was imitated by other studios who produced some American versions of the movie where they toned down a certain amount of the naughtiness. I remember watching a movie that I had seen several times as a teenager, and I finally got it on DVD. It was not a Hammer production, but it was very similar to the same genre. And there was a great surprise to me in the opening few seconds of the movie, watching a woman in a bikini uh, with pasties on her nipples whipping some guy into submission. That was not the version I saw in the 1970s, I assure you. Hammer Films also introduced a kind of supernatural mythology in their storylines, which they were pretty good at following up of from movie to movie. Many of their movies did have sequels. They launched several careers. Peter Cushing was Hammer's preeminent star in the late 1950s through the mid-70s, and remains, along with Christopher Lee, the the actor most commonly associated with the company. He played Baron Frankenstein, Dr. Van Helsing, and... Many of the characters are both heroic and villainous. For those of us who are big fans of the Star Wars franchise, he was Grand Moff Tarkin. Christopher Lee himself was propelled to international stardom when he portrayed Count Dracula in the first 1958 version and many, many sequels. He performed in other Hammer's movies as well. Now, to give you an idea how prolific they were, Curse of Frankenstein aired in 1956, and there were one, two, three, four, five, six sequels from the original Dracula in 1958. 
there were eight sequels. I am not quite so sure how the legend of the seven golden vampires in 1974 really falls in with the original Victorian Dracula. Christopher Lee played the mummy in 1959, whereas Peter Cushing played the archaeologist. There were three sequels to that. The Curse of the Werewolf, uh, they released in 1961. It was Hammer's only werewolf movie, and it starred a young actor named Oliver Reed. The studio was sold and resold several times over the years. In 2014, they released a movie on the paranormal called The Quiet Ones. In 2015, they released The Woman in Black, Angel of Death. And this year, 2019, they've released or will be releasing a movie called The Lodge. I realize this broadcast is going out on the Paranormal UK radio network, so a lot of you are probably familiar with English studios like Hammer. However, there is one American who I'd like to recognize as well. His name is Roger Corman, who was born in 1926. He's still alive. He was the Pope of Pop Cinema and was a trailblazer in the world of independent films. He really, in those earlier years, in the 50s and 60s, made his mark by producing a whole series of films based on the short stories of Edgar Allan Poe. And one of his major film stars was Vincent Price, who, if you were going to really name the horror giants in film of the 50s and 60s, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, and Vincent Price have to top that list. I'm lucky enough to know a few people have been involved in producing movies and television shows on a variety of genres. One of them is my friend Wayne Schmidt, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Wayne. Wayne was a film fan since almost birth, brought up on monster movie magazines like Famous Monsters and late night horror movie showings on local TV. In the late 70s, he co-wrote and co-produced a science fiction film called The Day Time Ended. He worked in the vaults of Columbia Pictures for a number of years before leaving to do assistant editor chores on several films in Salt Lake City. Wayne rode the wave of early non-linear editing in the 90s with low-budget epics like Dinosaur Island. In the mid-90s, he joined Sony Pictures helping to restore and prepare classic and catalog films for the dawn of HD television and home video. In the early 2000s, he went to Universal Studios to supervise new transfers of classic films to the HD market, and he moved to Portland in 2005 when he began working as an independent contractor for the studios on and off. He has been involved in community health care centers, serving on the board of directors for neighborhood health centers. So, welcome, Wayne. That one dinosaur movie, was that the one with Richard Boone in it? No. No. It was not. It was uh, it was con- considerably lower rent than that. Um, it was for Roger Corman. It was it was directed, co-directed actually by two uh, icons of the zero to low budget range movies being Jim Wynorski and Fred Olin Ray. And it was, uh, some people called it, you know, it was heavy on the boobs. People called it Titsanasic Park. <laughs> when Implants Ruled the Earth, I think was another another uh, name for it. It was w- the first film that I had done. And at that time, th- the uh, editing equipment that was out there was just moving over to what is now known as non-linear editing. And everybody can do it on their their home computers but back then it was an entirely different technique to, compared to old style film editing where you did it on a moviola and actual physical film and stuff so there was a lot of hesitancy on the part of, of many editors to even try that because it was just a whole different you know thing working with the computers and th- stuff and i just thought well what's the worst i can do i didn't have that much of a reputation as an editor so i figured i, I wasn't too worried about destroying it uh, i just volunteered to go ahead and, and work with the equipment you did a great job i've seen some of the work that you've done now you said that you work with roger corman how many movies did you work with him dinosaur island was produced by roger corman's company uh new new world i think or, or it was the one after that new horizons i didn't actually do much with roger corman and i never met him i, I actually have met him but i uh, not while i was working with him actually so i only did that one picture with him the other one that has a name in that arena is Charlie Band, and that was the gentleman who was the executive producer on the film that I co-wrote and co-produced called The Day Time Ended. Charlie's been around for a long, long time, still is, and that was back in the uh, 78, 79, something like that. He'd gone through several companies. His his reputation is very colorful, but he's done a lot of low-budget movies, uh, produced a lot of low-budget movies, everything from uh, Reanimator to uh, Laser Blast or a bunch of these things. That you, some of them you see turn up relatively frequently on on shows like Mystery Science Theater, things like that. Yeah, it's kind of sad that when somebody says low budget, that 
unfortunately, people who hear that, if they really don't get it, they seem to equate low budget with terrible. And, and sometimes low budget movies are terrible. Then again, big budget movies can be terrible too. The thing I love about low budget is it's usually somebody's passion project. Yeah, that's very true. And especially, um, I mean, that's still true today. Back in the 70s and back when you were shooting on 35 millimeter film, that wasn't a, even for a quote unquote low budget picture. That was a very expensive proposition. And the whole process, the, the whole post production process, uh, everything involved, making prints for theaters, all of that was, was thousands and thousands of dollars. So a low budget picture back then was a couple hundred thousand dollars you mentioned hammer films in the intro and you know hammer shows were usually in the range of about four hundred thousand dollars of course this is back in the the, uh, 50s 60s and and into the 70s and those were considered very low budget so the, the really the trick back then was to try to maximize what money you had to work with. And I think that's one of the reasons that Hammer has uh, lived on and has the uh, legendary status it does is that their pictures didn't look cheap, or at least for the most part. What they managed to achieve with the money they had was just phenomenal. But low-budget films in general from back in that period were, as you said, a lot of them were people's passion projects. They just were willing to make it for whatever money they could scrounge up. A lot of times... I would say maybe the majority of the time. If you got paid at all, it was very, very low wage. A lot of people lost a lot of money trying to do these shows. It was a very um, unsavory market as far as like once you had your film completed to to get it out there. You had to deal with distributors and and, uh, exhibition networks that were not the most upfront as far as with being honest with you with what films were making and things like that. It's very rare you come across somebody who made a picture back then that you've heard of and that went on to become relatively well-known that can say, yeah, I made a lot of money on that. Generally, the people that made the picture didn't. So the success stories from that period were not only to make a good movie, but was to be able to survive enough to continue in the field. Thanks for clarifying that, which then leads me to ask maybe two of your movies, the one that you were most passionate about, and hopefully that was the one that you made the most money at. Can you talk about either of those? Well, probably the one that, you know, when you say the movie you're most passionate about, the one I had the most direct involvement in was The Day Time Ended, which was made for Charlie Band. Uh, I did it as a um, project. I had a a friend, uh, Steve Neal, who started out in the makeup field, and that's how he got to know Charlie, because he did makeup for several of his previous low-budget movies, Laser Blast, End of the World, a couple other things like that. Charlie was always looking for an angle as to how to, again, get the maximum bang for the buck, so to speak. So he thought when Steve mentioned that he was interested in doing a picture, Charlie said, well, if you can come to me with something that's got like a lot of makeup in it or, you know, special effects or whatever, and we can do it cheaply, I'd be interested in doing that. And uh, since Steve and I were friends, we kind of got together and thought about what we wanted to do. We were both very big science fiction fans and horror film fans. In this particular case, we were trying initially to emulate like an Outer Limits type feel, which is what we really wanted to do. It was a science fiction film that dealt with going through different dimensions and stuff like that to give it a kind of that gothic feeling that the Outer Limits had. The end product looks nothing like that, unfortunately. Uh, And that's often the case, is that you start out with one thing in mind, and then reality sort of smacks you upside the head. And as you're you're into the project, you start incorporating all these other people's fields. You know, like in this case, we had a director that didn't really work with us in a way that I would have hoped. Uh, We had terrible, terrible cash flow problems, and we had to redesign things in a way that we didn't have, you know, it wasn't the original idea. So to make a long story short, the final project, I have always said my biggest accomplishment with it was that it got finished at all because there were so many big hiccups along the way. But it did, and it went out. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, um, some of these films that end up on MST3K, Mystery Science Theater, they just did our film, The Daytime Ended, over Thanksgiving on Netflix, and I think it's probably still playing there. 
on a technical note, I just want to say one thing about it. If people turn it on and go, what the hell am I looking at? There is, as most people are aware now with your newer TVs and things like this, there's what they call different aspect ratios, which is the shape of the picture. And normally back in those days, or, or one of your options was basically the same size screen as you have now at home, at, on home uh, monitors. But you could go wider, CinemaScope, or, or it's an anamorphic process where it squeezes the film out even wider. And in the old days, that the only way you could show that on a television, a square television, was to pan the picture back and forth while it was being transferred to try to capture the main information in the frame. And of course, as we all know from some of those screenings way back then on, on regular television, that could look very awkward. Well, we were sort of forced to use anamorphic process for, for this picture, which was okay. It complicated. The film was very effects heavy and it complicated that. Even worse, ever since then, it has been shown what we call pan and scan or center scan. And so you're missing a lot of picture information. And to add insult to injury, the original negative for it appears to be missing. So it's never been retransferred in the proper aspect ratio. So on the NS MST3K version, you're actually seeing it cropped one way and then cropped again to make it fit the 16 by 9 frame. So that's a long way of explaining why it looks so silly. <laughs> okay. It's, it's not my fault. He said it's not my fault. It's not my fault. I would love to see it redone. I mean, yes, the film is, even if it had been presented in the correct aspect ratio, is not going to you know win any awards. But uh, it's not as silly looking as it is on television. And then you throw the robot, robots into it from MS3T, MST3K, and uh, you got very little of the original picture left. Well, all I can say, and I would say this, even if you weren't my friend, you finished a movie, and I, and I haven't, and I'll never be able to do one. So... Far be it for me to be overly critical. You know, nowadays, of course, it's much easier on the front end to to make a film. I mean, we have access to, uh, you know, video quality of, you know, 4K on your telephone. And indeed, a couple of pictures have been shot entirely on people's smartphones. But it doesn't alleviate the fact that you can have a finished product, but it, the field is so crowded trying to get it out there and get it noticed can be a real effort, a real Herculean effort, actually. So, yeah, it's still it's still an accomplishment. I've always said to people when they talk about this film being terrible or that film being terrible, it's like a terrible movie is still a lot of work. You have to respect it on that level. I mean, in doing a film from a labor standpoint, if you're directly involved with it every day and the shooting and everything, is, is one of the hardest jobs you can do. It deserves respect even if it failed miserably. <laughs> it's the way I look at it. Like I said, I've, I've seen that work. And, and then once you mentioned the other projects you'd work on, I've seen some of those other ones, and, and I really am impressed. And this gets to the fact that most people who watch movies, let's face it, if you were in a theater... And the credits roll, you wait till you see who the actors and actresses are, and then you walk out. Similarly, if you're at home and they're rolling the credits, that's when you get up, go to the bathroom, get something to eat or drink out of the fridge. So you may well know who the stars are. And if you're someone like me, you look at who the bit players are and say, oh my God, this bit pay player pretty soon became a Hollywood superstar. You know, who knew them when? Most mm -hmm. people miss the whole base of the pyramid that is the the sound people the camera people the i still don't know what a best boy does but you miss the best boy you miss all the crew and and so you kind of represent that to me well thank you <laughs> i didn't actually meet you just on the street you were introduced to me by another one of these to me unsung hollywood heroes remember michael mike hoover yeah mike hoover who right. uh, special effects Don, because he always wears a suit. So I mean, he's kind of <laughs> like Don Michael Hoover. You and I both know who he is. For a little more information for people listening, Michael Hoover's most famous work to most people is probably his work on the movie, the original movie, Ghostbusters. Mm, right, right. Uh, he designed the Hellhounds, the animatronic or stop-action motion Hellhounds. I hope to have him on a, as a guest sometime soon, too. Yeah, that's right. Well, I've known Mike since. I mean, he's he's literally, I think, the oldest friend I have. I, I've known him since I was like 12 or something like that, a long time ago. It, it was a very, one of those things where they say, you know, it's a small world. It really was because our paths would cross as we were growing up and we didn't even realize 
that it was that person. Mike and I started comparing notes in high school and realized, oh, well, you were in that YMCA. Yeah, I remember that. And, you know, on and on. So it was, uh, we've, our paths have been entwined virtually since our childhood. And we did a few early you know, student films together, that kind of stuff. He got more into model building and special effects. He did some acting too. And then from there, he, he got into, you know, CG work, early early days of CG work. So he's been actively involved. He's got an Emmy for his participation. I think it was in some television series. I can't remember which one it was off the top of my head. He's a, definitely an industry, industry veteran. He's been around the block a few times. We love to compare war stories and he also did a number of pictures from an effects standpoint with Charlie Band. So then we have that rather ignoble <laughs> commonality, I guess. He's, he's like I said, I, I've known him longer than just about anybody else. There, there is a, uh, a thing about working in the business, and it's one of the reasons I came up here. You reach a point where you really do get burned out. Actually, in my own case, I ended up moving sort of laterally because of my background my film experience i moved into post-production type stuff at initially columbia pictures and then uh, i left for a while and then i came back when it was sony pictures and then from there moved over to universal but at sony i was primarily really interested because again this kind of gets back to the whole respect for films and people i think nowadays are much more aware of the fact that film is is uh, delicate and it has to be stored properly and it's quite easy to lose a picture for any number of reasons it can be anything from bad storage bad you know records they don't know where stuff is to just the the physical aspects of the film itself can break down overuse gets just like anything if it if it gets used too much it, it develops scratches and splices and missing footage and all this kind of stuff so again i kind of got in on on the front end of uh when the high definition markets were opening up and it was no longer going to cut it to just put out a, a crummy video copy of something that, you know, was just doesn't look very good when it, when DVD came around. And then, of course, now with Blu-ray and 4K and all that, it's people are very picky about the way these films look. So got involved in some of the early uh, stages of film restoration. Well, which films did you work on? Sony Pictures. I, I was in the market division. So in other words, I was given a, a list of 10 films and said, look, we're going to be transferring these. They need to be cleaned up and this and that and the other thing. And they, we got to have them in two months kind of thing. So I was working with, it was really like juggling. You know, I had all these films out of different labs being evaluated for the quality. It, again, without going into the whole technical aspect of it, you know, when you shoot a movie back then, you have the original negative, the film that ran through the camera. That is then cut and edited to represent what the final picture is going to look like. And then from there, you make multiple generation copies down to get to the point where you've got a what would be referred to as an inner negative or a dupe negative, which is what the theatrical prints in the old days uh, were made from. So when you were redoing these things in high definition, a lot of times you'd have to, there might be damage to the original negative. So you'd have to look at some of these sub-generation material to try to use bits and pieces of all this stuff to make it look as good as you could. So there were a lot of, I mean, I literally did over a hundred films at, at Sony. The one that was really my, <laughs> in some respects, Waterloo, but it was the one I felt the most strongly about was the uh, 57 picture uh Night of the Demon or Curse of the Demon. That was a very interesting project because, first of all, and again, I, I think it, it relates mostly to your uh, to what your audience might be familiar with. It's a classic supernatural film, really, really great movie, and it posed a lot of problems. And it's based on an M.R. Davis uh, or M.R. Uh, James, I'm sorry, M.R. James uh, short story, Casting the Runes. It was an interesting problem because it actually existed in multiple versions. There was a longer version, and then it was cut down for whatever reasons. That's still somewhat uh, controversial as to why it was done or where it was, you know, what the different markets were. But the the longer version is by far the better one, and that's the one I really wanted to uh, to restore. When I went to look for this stuff, it was actually, the long version was actually missing. So there was a, a long <laughs> and very strange situation where I was trying to stall, because again, this was just based on market. Hey, we have to have this in two months we're going to transfer it and it's going out on you know to dvd or whatever it was like well if you can't supply the long you know the long version then we'll just have to use what you got and i really didn't want to do that so i kept stalling them hoping to find this thing and again to make a long story short it turned out that 
I had a friend who was a uh, film collector that I just knew through various channels. And we were discussing it one day and I said, you know, look, I, you know, this is really terrible. I can't find this, this long version of this picture. He said, he got this weird look on his face. And then he said, well, actually I have that element, that film element. And I was like, okay, <laughs> well, uh, that's great. Uh, I need it. And, um, you know, because technically it was a stolen item. He didn't steal it. He bought it through a dealer, but I mean, it was still our original element for that film for the long version to make a very long story short, I did get it back from him and, and we were able to, you know, get it put out in the best presentation possible. Uh, it just recently came out in, in the UK and I think maybe it's available here through a company called indicator that has put out a, uh, Blu-ray set. I think it's four discs or three, one of the two, which has the long version, the short version, the long version with the original title, Night of the Demon, the short version with the American title, Curse of the Demon, and on and on. I mean, it, it is the most complete uh, edition of this thing you're ever going to see. And, uh, it deserves it. I think anybody out there who hasn't seen this picture should check it out, because if you're interested in um, demonology and supernatural stuff and things, it's it's a great movie. It's got Dana Andrews in it, and uh, Peggy Cummins, and it, it's just First class, great movie. Dana Andrews. That's one of the things that I really enjoyed about watching movies from camera studios. They would hire these English actor actresses, some of whom ran the gamut from doing Shakespearean work to, to let's face it, moderately low budget vampire movies. Is they would turn in the same quality of performance, whether it be doing Shakespeare, playing Mark Antony, or playing the the tortured vampire slave. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the reasons that they do stand up so well is because, um, especially the classic ones, which would be from the late 50s through the mid 60s, I guess, the quality of performances, well, everything about them, really, but but you're right, the quality of performances, people like Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, Andrew Kerr, uh, Michael Ripper, who was in virtually, seems like I think he was on, in almost everything they did. Some of them not very well known to American audiences, but the quality was just so good that the professionalism was so high that you never got the impression that you were watching some crummy, you know, who cares type of production. It was it was always they might as well have been doing Shakespeare could be doing Plague of the Zombies. But the way they approached the material was dead serious just you know it's still to this day very awe-inspiring when you look at their films and, and realize what they were done you know how they were made how much they were made for they had a lot of behind the scenes kind of cost-cutting things they did that that made it possible especially in the later days to crank these things out for you know lower budgets like reusing sets and, and shooting back to back on some films and things like that but still, I think I don't I don't know that anybody can really for a body of work, a studio like that, anybody can really uh, come close. Yeah. And so I am looking forward. I will go out and get the DVD set myself because I love Dana Andrews as an actor. He did. He has this whole serious, serious body of work, but it almost was expected during the 50s to early 60s. You would have Hollywood movie stars doing horror movies. Odd bit of casting was Day of the Triffids. I think that was with Howard Keel, but he treated it as a serious project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, uh, Night of the Demon was directed by Jacques Turner, who uh, had done a lot of very famous film noir uh, movies. He was a real A-lister director for a number of years in Hollywood, and then and then he kind of just fell off fell off the thing, the wagon, so to speak, uh, not alcoholically, but I mean he was just he wasn't he wasn't being thought of in those terms anymore. But he'd done a couple of pictures with Dana Andrews, and I don't know if he was directly uh, responsible for Andrews being cast in the film, but Andrews was in a similar position. He was he was a very A level uh, name for a goodly portion, but by the late fifties, he was you know still obviously well known, but n not in that same category. And a lot of those uh, a lot of those stars like that did end up going over to England making pictures. Of course, some of them ended up in Italy making <laughs> anything from really good movies to things where you went kind of scratched your head. And when I'm thinking of, there's a, a film with. Um, <laughs> with Bro Broderick Crawford as a Roman emperor or something. It's just like, that's got to be the most grotesque casting I can think of. But <laughs> Hey, it's a paycheck. <laughs> yeah. Or if you were Jack Nicholson, you went over to Europe and made some movies with Vincent Price and then came back just in time to, uh, to do Easy Rider. Well, I think most of Nicholson's stuff, the, uh, like he was in the Raven, of course, with Vincent Price, and then um, Little Shop of Horrors. I'm sorry, Little Shop of Horrors. Little Shop of Horrors. All those were done over here, though. 
actually the Vincent Price Poe pictures, the first one of those to be made in England was Mask of the Red Death, and that was long after Nicholson had found well, actually, he hadn't found fame and fortune yet in, in uh, Easy Rider, but he had moved on to like the other AIP type stuff, Psych Out and things like that. But the majority of the price made in, in uh, the U.S. But yeah, those guys, you know, Nicholson and I mean, Corman is, of course, famous for the fact that he started many careers. People, you know, made these films that were... <laughs> But today considered classic. Again, Corman is another guy that that um, is looked at with great respect because he was able to just turn these things out for you know re- reasonably low budgets. But like you look at the Poe films, and those are all really really handsome productions. Yeah, you know, part of that was because he used really great cinematographers that were well known professionals have done some really high-end movies that just you know that's the thing about the film business in general is that you know you can be riding high and then all of a sudden unless you made a fortune there you'll hit these these periods where yeah you you know you need some money you gotta get you gotta have a job so you may take something that you're not overwhelmed at or may seem beneath your station or something but you need the paycheck so yeah that reminds me you had told a story about uh sort of meeting christopher lee yeah, I, I met Christopher Lee briefly at a screening of The Wicker Man, and this was before the film had been released in the United States. Uh, he was sort of on a one-man crusade to to get the film out and get the film recognized, and he had a screening of it down at, I think it was the old Technicolor building down in Hollywood at one of their screening rooms. I don't remember how I got the invite for it, but I ended up going down there, and I talked to him very briefly. He's He was not a particularly gregarious fellow he was he did not suffer fools gladly shall we shall we say and he wasn't just kind of like hello who are you that kind of thing i mean it wasn't it wasn't you weren't overwhelmed with the warmth (laughs) and he he was upset about something i can't remember somebody had promised to show up some executive promised to show up to the screening and wasn't going to or something like that i just remember him talking to one of the people that put the thing together and he was on this tirade and he was saying that simply isn't done to christopher lee okay well this is probably not the greatest time to kind of try to strike up a conversation with the guy but i've never unfortunately never had a chance to, to you know work on a film that he was in or anything like that i have my own christopher lee story nowhere near as impressive as yours actually i have two which you're part of always been a fan of his and I did my graduate school in England, lived there for a year, and I go back to visit every now and then. And one year, one of my friends gave me a copy of his biography, which was Tall, Dark, and Gruesome. Mm -hmm. And I had been online and reading about Christopher Lee. And according to some of the scuttlebutt on the internet, he would autograph pictures or books for people if they left it at his uh, agent's offices with the appropriate postage in an envelope. So... Me being me, I wouldn't drag my wife along with some international postage stamps in a, in a padded envelope over to Christopher Lee's offices and drop them off. And they said, we don't know when Mr. Lee can come back to sign this, sir. He's overseas in New Zealand making a movie. <laughs> and little did I know that that was going to be Lord of the Rings. Oh, wow. And a couple months later... Uh, the envelope arrived, and it even I believe it was Mr. Lee who, himself who filled out and signed the um, the international customs form. So I have the envelope as well as the book. Terrific. Which I've only read once, and I have not creased the pages. <laughs> But the other Christopher Lee artifact I actually owe to you is that one bust. Right, the the uh, life mask, the life mask. And that's funny because that, that kind of, again, loops back to our conversation. That life mask was made by Steve Neal, the guy that I co-wrote and I co-produced The Daytime Ended with. Uh, and it was made for a Charlie Band production called End of the World. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Go but ahead. in his bio, Christopher Lee states quite clearly that is the worst movie he ever made. <laughs> <laughs> well, not that, not that I'm, I, you know, I'll watch anything with Christopher Lee in it, but there's a few that would, I would think, compete for that honor. But End of the World is not a good movie, no. It's, it's, it's the, the thing that Charlie used to do, and uh, actually Corman used to do it as well, was, it was a common thing for, for low-budget producers, was to get a name like Christopher Lee or Vince Price or whoever, Peter Cushing, and couldn't afford them for a major role in the film, so you'd, you'd pay them for you know, a day's work or two days work, something like that. Write a small role, have them come in. And then of course, 
when the film came out, it was, you know, starring Christopher Lee or something like that when he's in about five minutes of it. And in that particular picture, it's been years since I've seen it, but it seems to me that the, the life mask was made because at the end of the film, he takes off his face and he's an alien or something like that. So that was why Steve cast him, life cast him. And then once you have a mold, you can make multiple copies out of that mold. And he made me one of Christopher Lee's uh, face. And I had that thing for years. <laughs> <laughs> and carried it around with me from one place to the next. And then, of course, when I met you, we were talking about it at that time. You said, oh, gee, I'd love to have that thing. So I'm glad it found a, a, a welcome home. Yeah. Matter of fact, I got custody of Sir Christopher in the divorce. And <laughs> in addition to that, I built a wooden box. I, so so he's the, the face in the box. That uh, picture of, of that bust is kind of on the logo for my podcast. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. And uh, sometimes he travels to, to book signings with me and people say, who is that? He looks so familiar, but oh my God, that's Dracula <laughs> or, or Saruman the White, uh, depending on your, how old you are. I remember when, when you were interested in it and you wanted to see a picture of it. And Jeff and I, uh, my partner, we put the bust on a pillow on the bed and pulled the sheets up around it. You know, when you when you just look at an unpainted life mask, uh, this one has a, a slightly faint flesh tone to it, but it's that's the actual color of the material it's made from. It was never painted. You know, you look at it and you go, oh, wait a minute, I looks familiar. who is that? And then eventually you, you kind of figure it out. But in that particular case, when it was put on that pillow and the, and the, the sheets were pulled up, you told you could see right away it was Christopher Lee, and frankly, he looked dead. It was it was a little disturbing. It was like wow, you know, because the 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 life mask itself is only half of the person's head, it's the front half. So, but with it resting in the pillow like that, it 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 looked like the real deal. So, didn't have to convince you that it was Christopher Lee. It was, it was quite obvious. Yeah, yeah, and and I treasure Sir Christopher. Uh... <laughs> I would like to be able to, to say he's a comfort in my times of loneliness, but no, he's not quite that. <laughs> no, I, w I don't think uh, he would be well well remembered for being of comfort. <laughs> no, his, no. Uh, although his... <laughs> after reading his biography, I am duly impressed. He spent some time as in World War II uh, working for the SAS, the Strategic Air Services, the British Special Forces. He's part of the European aristocracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A man of many parts. He's an amazing individual. He really was. It's funny because, again, talking about the Hammer Stars and, and Christopher Lee, my personal favorite was always Peter Cushing. And again, kind of looping back to what we were discussing earlier, one of the guys that was the co-director on Dinosaur Island, I had the editing suite for that film set up in my, my office, which also had all my videotapes and stuff lined up on the on the one wall. And Fred Olin Ray, the one director, came in one day. He was looking at the you know what I was cutting and everything, and then when he started looking at the titles on the on the wall, the various films I had, and one of them was this thing called Oh my gosh, I'm gonna embarrass myself. Not Shock Troops, Shock Waves, I think is what it's called. Which is this low budget horror film about underwater Nazis that come back. It's actually not a bad picture for uh, again, probably made for nickels and dimes. It was one of these situations where. Peter Cushing agreed to be in it for a day or two days or whatever for the amount of money. Fred, at that time, was a production assistant, which is basically just a gopher. You do whatever anybody asks you to do on the set. And he was also a huge monster film fan and everything, and it was in complete awe of Peter Cushing. At one point, they said, well, Mr. Cushing's in his dressing room taking his, his tea. So <laughs> Fred went in there with the tea tray and everything, and... Peter Cushing was there, and, and Cushing was notorious for being just the, the most gentle, nice individual. And Fred's trying to set this tray down, and, and Cushing is going, Oh, my dear boy, you look exhausted. Please, have a seat. You know, Would you like some tea? And he's like trying to explain to Cushing, No, 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 It's you, you've got this reversed. I'm supposed to be doing this for you, not the other way around. You know, So it was actually kind of disconcerting because it was like, having Peter Cushing serving you there up the tea and stuff like that. And I thought, gee, I wish everybody was that nice. Yeah. It's Christopher Lee is setting him down and saying, shall I be mother and poor? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, I have not had nearly the experience you have. I've had some kind of almost 
our lives were movies. I've had a couple of walk-on roles where I've encountered Hollywood people. I had a couple bit parts in, in movies myself. I remember almost meeting Elvira. First name, real name is Cassandra. I was at the World Horror Convention. No, no, no. It was it was Crypticon up in Seattle a couple of years ago. And I got on this one elevator. And I, ha- I was a vendor. I had a case of books with me. But a whole bunch of us crowded onto this elevator. And it was so crowded that when the elevator doors closed my nose would have been touching the elevator doors. It was that close. It was so claustrophobic. I actually turned around facing inside the elevator so that at least I wasn't looking at this blank wall. And directly across from me, behind some equipment on a dolly, was this beautiful redheaded woman. And I looked at her and I said, she looks so familiar. Holy crap, that's Elvira. (laughs) And and she saw my eyes kind of focus on her and she got this kind of panic look because who knows what would have happened, what I would have yelled in this elevator because I really, I stifled this yell of, my father wants you to have his love child. <laughs> anyway, so I, I stifled that and smiled back and she relaxed knowing that I wasn't going to freak out on her. And then, ding, you know, we arrived and we all got off. <laughs> I've heard that she's very nice, actually. And, of course, she was, uh, before Avira, she was in one of the Bond pictures, I think Diamonds Are Forever. And she did a few other small roles and stuff. It is always nice when you when you meet people that are a certain degree of, of fame, and they turn out to be really nice people. I, similar situation, or not, uh, similar to the Christopher Lee thing, I was invited to a screening of a film that Oliver Reed was in, and this was probably 10 years before he died. So it was, it was during his rough period. You know, he was, he was not looking terrific. I uh, went up, he was sitting next to the woman who was the makeup artist on the picture. And I guess she was his date for the night or something like that. But I went up and I didn't even recognize him at first. And then when I did, I thought, God, before I recognized him, I thought, man, the hostility coming off of this guy was just phenomenal. And I was like, this is this, oh my God, it's, it's all her read. And it was just like, you could believe everything I ever <laughs> heard about him especially if uh, you know he had knocked back a few before the before the screening or something it was like wow this is not somebody i would just come up and tug on their shirt and go hi can i have an autograph just uh, that was not the vibe that was coming off at all so you know for every peter cushing oliver reed is probably a really nice guy was probably a nice guy to write under the right circumstances but from what the vibe i got off him that night i wouldn't have i wouldn't have wanted to try to uh pursue anything with him that's for sure now oliver reed uh, the actor uh, he died his last movie was gladiator where he right. was the uh, uh gladiator trainer he got a lot of movies through hammer as well yeah, really yeah. Cool. yeah i don't know if he got a start with hammer i think he may have done one or two pictures before that or maybe they saw him on the stage i can't remember but of course one of the big ones that uh, he's remembered for from that period is curse of the werewolf where he played the werewolf and um uh, one of the women that co-starred with him, I can't remember her name offhand, was telling him that at the time, you know, they said, you got such great presence and so on and so forth. You should, you know, don't make these low budget schlocky things. You should be out doing theater and stuff like that. And he was like, no, I'm perfectly happy to do this. <laughs> he enjoyed it. He thought it was a lot of fun. And he, he uh, did end up doing a, a number of the Hammer films. And then, of course, he made The Devils and other stuff that put him into a, the next class up, so to speak, as far as films are concerned. Yeah, yeah. What a what a talented guy. It's too bad that he fell prey to the demon rum. Yeah. Or yeah. champagne like, or whatever it, it was. Again, Steve Neal uh, did the makeup on that picture. I, I went and saw him at the screening of and Reed had to come in again. I don't think they even did a life mask on, but they did some design the it was a, a takeoff on dr jekyll and mr hyde and he had to do the mr hyde makeup on him and i remember steve telling me that he was very nice and everything and they did their thing and then after he completed what he came in for he said to steve hey you don't want to go out and catch a you know a drink or something steve thought oh, all right you know so he went out with him and he said that's the last thing i remember <laughs> <laughs> Just remember waking up the next day going, I don't know what I did or where we were at. But, you know, it was obviously turned into a little more than just a drink. And and where did I get that tattoo and piercing? Yeah, pretty much. My on-set experience has been fairly limited. I, of course, on the show that I co-produced, I had to be on on the... uh, at the locations and stuff, but I mostly stayed away from it. I, I mostly stayed in the uh, in the production offices and stuff because there was just so much to do. But when you're physically working these shows, all sorts of 
<laughs> things happen. Sometimes some embarrassing things happen, but it's it it all goes with the territory. I mean, that by by the standards of so many things is pretty pretty mild. Yeah, it, it can kind of give you a sense of what did I just do? <laughs> so, again, any film. When people say, well, "Gee, was that fun to work on?" It's like, well, yeah, it was fun, but. Boy, it was a lot of work, you know, it, it, you know, 12, 14 hour days, six day weeks and, and low budget movies, sometimes seven day weeks. It's it's brutal. And, and the only reason it's really doable is because it's usually for a finite period, weeks or maybe a month, six weeks or something. Yeah, it's like an endurance but, race. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. And by the end of it, people start to get very, very frazzled. Uh, you know, I threatened many a time. I, I, there were two experiences that I had as far as working on films that I often thought kind of, they were just like Fellini. Just were so, the thing got so surreal. One was was daytime ended, but I also worked on a series of movies up in Salt Lake City that were just really strange. The uh, It was a series of three movies. Two had been shot before I got there. They were working on the third one. And I, I came up to help a friend of mine who was the editor on the shows, and I was the assistant editor. It was every day was just like, I can't believe this is happening. You know, it was so strange. The production offices were in, it's in Salt Lake City, so obviously heavy Mormon territory. The production offices were in what they called uh, what used to be a steakhouse. You'd have to ask a Mormon why it's called that. Or it's essentially, it's a church. It's a Mormon church. And when they were using it for a location, they were shooting in parts of it and stuff. Well, these movies had a lot of, shall we say, unsavory elements in them. You know, a lot of nudity, sex, and stuff like this. And <laughs> when when it got out what we were doing or what was being shot, and somehow, of course, as anything like that happens, it gets, you know, magnified that we weren't just making a, a movie with, uh, you know, nudity and it. it was a porno or something. Mm -hmm. And they literally almost, I felt like it was in a Frankenstein film or something. All they needed were the, the torches. <laughs> torches and pitchforks. Yeah. They showed up this mob and, you know, we were down in the basement. We had windows that looked out onto the parking lot and I could see this parade of, I hear all these angry voices and this parade of feet going by. And I'm thinking, they're going to burn the place down or something. I, I just was like, I'm afraid for my life. How the hell do I get out of here? You know? And they, you know, gift of gab somehow you know, swage their fears. No, no, we're not shooting a porno and so on and so forth. But every day was something weird or surreal like that. And the final films themselves were <laughs> just, they were all th three of them were actually edited together into a trilogy film called the night train to tear. And it's just has to be seen to be believed. I remember it, the uh, review for it in Variety, I think, said it, it was in the sweepstakes for the worst film ever made. It, it You just couldn't believe it. And it had Cameron Mitchell in it. It had Richard Maul, who was the guy who played um, Bull. 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 Yeah, right. Bull in, uh, in Night Court. It had, oh boy, what's his name? My mind just went blank. The guy that was, John Philip Law was in one of them. It was this weird experience that I, it was a summer. I always call that the summer I ran away and joined the circus because that's what it felt like. It really was <laughs> just bizarre beyond belief. And the guy who was kind of running the thing, uh, his name was Phil Jordan. He was an Academy Award winner. Uh, he, yeah, he was uh, associated so with he, the great, not the greatest story ever told, but uh, Jeffrey Hunter's movie where he played Jesus. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, he did that, and he did uh, a couple of other things. He was also what they referred to as a beard, in that he would cover blacklisted writers back in the day and, and uh, submit their scripts and stuff under his name. In fact, this, the film I think he won the Academy Award for, I think, was Detective Story. The point being that these were like the names, yeah. <laughs> this was just like something right out of uh, some fevered nightmare or something. Those kind of experiences are once in a lifetime, literally, and I wouldn't trade them for the world. They were quite, quite something else. And now speaking of of which, since a lot of these were horror and ghost and demon movies, how does it compare to your own real life ghost haunting experience? Well, you know, I, I've, I've never really been a ghost hunter per se. I've been interested in the supernatural since I was a kid. There was a series of books that used to come out. I think Time Life put them out or something about the supernatural. I used to have these books would come every month and I had these things. I'd look through them. I was just fascinated by witchcraft and magic and all that stuff. I've had several personal experiences. I've had things happen where I go, wow. My personal 
philosophy is that I think really if you could get people to concentrate and really think about it, probably almost everybody's had some sort of supernatural or, or extrasensory experience in their life. It may have only happened once. It may have only happened for 10 minutes. And your mind just goes, well, I don't know what that was. And just you just go on your merry way and you kind of forget about it. Because when I talk to people, most of the time they'll say, oh, you know, I did have this thing happen once. I never really thought, you know, I was probably sick or maybe it was, you know, it wasn't what I thought it was or something like that. It's a very common experience that people tend to discount. And at one point, I the most vivid one I had was an Ouija board experience. I'm sure people kind of roll their eyes and go, yeah, okay, everybody's had the Ouija board experience. But not like this. I um, had a roommate at the time and we had this Ouija board kicking around. I can't remember who's belong to where it came from and we decided one night oh what the heck let's just play around with this thing see what happens and for i'd say for like the first 15 20 minutes it was your basic stuff you know that anybody who plays around with one kind of experiences you know the plan check goes to the yes and the no and maybe spells out you ask it something and it says yes or nothing really very substantial but then one night this thing took off I can't remember what the question was that we asked it, but all of a sudden it just started going so fast that it was, you know, I was looking at my, at my roommate and he's looking at me and we're both, it's like, you know, throwing out these letters and we have no idea what it's saying because it's it's so fast. We can't even put the words together. The words are run on and things like that. So we stopped, we went over, hooked up a recorder and, and a microphone and went back and started again. And as the letters were being spelled out, we just were yelling them into the microphone saying, okay, you know, it's B A D blah, 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 blah. And then when we get to a stopping spot, we would stop the session, go over, play the tape back, and be able to break it down by the words as opposed to just run on letters. And they were complete sentences. It was very it had a very distinct personality. It claimed that it was the spirit of Edgar Allan Poe. It was specifically interested in me because I was writing a screenplay at the time about ghost experiences or a situation that storyline of the film dealt with very specifically with going through the other world at that time through a computer and stuff, which was not, was common then. And it was very interested in what I was doing. And, you know, you could say, well, gee, you know, that could be my roommate doing this, but it would use words and, and phrases that neither of us knew what they meant. We had to go look them up. One time this went on for like, oh, I don't know, probably seven or eight days in, in, a, in a row that we did these. And one night we tried it and there was nothing kind of back to the meandering stuff that you do and, you know, on an Ouija board. We thought, oh, well, I guess that's the end of that. And then we tried it the next night and it like snapped in right away. One of the first things that I, we said, well, where were you last night? One of the first things it spelled out was Quo Vadis. And I looked at Fritz, my roommate, and I said, I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? He goes, I don't know what it is. So I had to go look, you know, and look it up. And it stands for Weather Goest Thou. So basically, it was kind of like saying, well, I was here. Where were you? You know, I mean, it was just a, a, an amazing experience. And I, I did a transcript of it. I don't know where I put it, but I, I had a transcript the entire thing. And this went on for about eight days, seven or eight days. And then it's, it said specific things about the script. We'll do this. Don't do that. You know, this kind of stuff. And it could be quite testy, too. It said, okay, I am going to, you know, uh, I was going to work on the script that Saturday. And it said, I will be there. Okay, great. Channel it or something. I don't know. You know, I sat around Saturday and I was trying to write this thing. I kind of had a mental block. And I thought, well, you know, I kept thinking about this one. Well, gee, I wonder how this is going to manifest. And nothing seemed to happen. And then the next night when we were back on it, I said, well, Edgar, where were you? I was here Saturday. I didn't see you. And it spelled out, you expect me to write it. <laughs> I was like, no, no, really, I don't. I was just, you know. But it was, it was, it was just a very, very amazing experience. And it specifically said, "This is the last night I'm going to do this," and basically signed off. And after that, as much as we tried, nothing ever happened again. So it's one of those experiences that you know anybody who listens to it or, or hears about it can say, "Well, yeah, but your friend was doing it, or somehow you're." You'll never convince me of that because the personality was palpable. I mean, it was there. Now, whether you want to call it a ground power or not, it's something else. One of the other things I asked it was, uh, I said, well, do you help other writers? And it came back and it said, Stephen King. Yeah, I thought, well, that's interesting. And and then I, just purely uh, on its own, it started to spell something else. And it went, <laughs> it said, have you seen his movie? And this was around the time that that, that film he directed, um, the one with the trucks, I can't remember, I think the name of it off the top of my head, had just come out. And it was 
getting panned big time. He asked, have you seen this? Have you seen this movie? And I said, no. And he said, it's terrible. (laughs) Not only was he testy, he was a critic too. So who knows? But uh, you'll never convince me that there wasn't something going on there that was definitely of a supernatural nature. Because like I said, it was just too fast for either of us to just be winging it and you know using terminology that we just didn't even understand using words we didn't understand so the screenplay i wrote out of that i did complete but i've never i've never sold it and unfortunately it was it was sort of related to technology at the time and now i'd have to significantly rewrite it for it to make to be anything again but it's too bad because i thought i thought it would have yeah, maybe Edgar could help me out with an agent or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what kind of spiritual compensation the agent would be demanding. I don't know. You have to work that out with Edgar. Well, great. I see by the clock on the wall, actually the, the counter on my audio recorder, that we're pretty close to the end of our time together. Uh, is there anything that we have not talked about that still sticks out at you? Uh, no, not too much. I mean, I think it's real interesting in this day um, and age, so to speak, that where these kind of films have gone, you know, as far as like films dealing with ghosts and the supernatural and things like that, there's been, you know, it was fairly rare in the, in the sixties and and seventies stuff. I mean, there were certainly ghost movies and things, but the more sort of cerebral type stuff, say like the others, that film with Nicole Kidman or some of the other things that are coming out now, um, the witch uh, film came out a couple of years ago it's it's really i think they're really exploring the more interesting aspects of of the phenomena and i think that's great blood and thunder horror movies are fun too but it's nice to see the stuff that has a little more you know, thought behind it and gets into the more of the textures of the whole of the whole supernatural so hopefully that'll keep happening i agree with you as a matter of fact perhaps my favorite horror movie of all time very low tech moderate budget came out in the 1970s and it was called legend of hell house it starred roddy mcdowell clive revel and gail honeycutt sure based on a richard matheson's uh, novel exactly what's your favorite horror movie well again you know it's kind of hard to break it down into just a favorite film because it depends on the i mean for like a, a gothic i have to say the first christopher lee dracula horror dracula is the one that i i've seen so many times i can you know, virtually note frame by frame. I just love that film. It was it was such a revisionist take on it for the time, and I, I just think it's a, a great piece of movie making on every level. But for a supernatural film, probably the original version of The Haunting with Julie Harris again has that element of the textures to it are are really fascinating in that you could, I suppose, say that it's her mental illness or whatever you want to call it that's that's causing a lot of it but it's a very uh, layered movie and very scary i agree i agree i hope uh, our listeners here have maybe had some something to think about and enjoyed your reminiscences of mine it's sometimes it's hard to separate what is a movie about the paranormal and what is let's face it what is what is hype about the paranormal and do our expectations from these movies alter our perception of what happens in a haunting well i hope it does at least cause people to think again as as i said these films are now getting to be a little more layered a little more interesting and as you point out there's been so much of this on cable television reality tv and things like that that you know some of it's good some of it's not so good i would just say to people you know look inside yourselves think of your own backgrounds your own experiences that thing that seemed not so significant when you were a kid maybe give it another thought i agree thank you so much wayne for taking the time to talk to me and everybody else happy to do it i hope you all enjoyed listening to wayne's reminiscences after learning more about his recent editing work is how is this going to affect younger audiences while many of the lower budget movies of the 50s and 60s were black and white for budgetary reasons they also had a certain film noir appeal With very little money for special effects, the cast and crew had to rely on lighting, acting. They tell a story better with background and content than modern films using special effects. I hope that a new generation of film goers, makers, and paranormal investigators will find these older films cause them to think deeper into the nature of the supernatural and its portrayal. Thank you all for listening, and I look forward to our next get-together. Good night.
Our theme music has been Dance Macabre by Camille Sancien, performed by Kevin McLeod, www.incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. Thank you for listening to The Peculiar World here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. (laughs) 